enhance your performance through stress management. Uh, of course, um, all of you have completely different background, so that uh, of course, if you hear uh, stress management or if you hear performance enhancement, of course, each of you has different idea. For example, if you are a system engineer, then of course, uh, you want to enhance your performance in a uh, no, computer. Or if you are a salesperson, then could be your performance enhancement will be focusing on communication skill. Or I don't know what kind of uh, things you really want to enhance, but um, today's topic will be um, performance enhancement for anybody. So I would like to talk about just the basics of uh, sports psychology. So I, I will explain about this. But, um, so I hope uh, at the end of the speech, I do hope that uh, everybody get a clue of, okay, maybe I can use that skill, I can use this psychological skill tomorrow. So I hope it will be useful. Okay, who am I? Um, Right now, I am not a synchronized swimmer anymore. Uh, right now, I am a performance enhancement consultant. What is it? What I'm doing is, uh, one, is a mental training for women. That is only two athletes, Olympians, professional golfers, or professional soccer players. Uh, since this year is Beijing Olympic year, so that um, um, right now, this is February, uh, there are many, many athletes still are not um, on the uh, Olympic team yet, because there are many trials uh, right now in February, especially. Uh, probably until, it'll be last until April or May, there are many, many sports still uh, don't want to decide the Olympians yet. They really want to just go to the end. So that, uh, there are some Olympians coming to my office and uh, asking me to do mental training. Professional golfers and pro professional soccer players, to them, I am most likely doing um, career transition program uh, seminar. But that will, uh, I will explain about this. The second one is stress management. That is uh, what I'm doing, uh, not to athletes, to business people or other people like this, such as mothers or um, teachers. Transition coping to business people or others and daily life stress coping to business people or others. Uh, maybe I should explain about this a little bit. What is um, transition or what is daily life stress? There are two types of stress. One is called life event. Another one is called daily stress. Uh, it's not written here. Life event is, I mean in Japanese, when we hear event, sounds like an exciting, uh, I don't know, like a festival or something. But uh, this life event means, um, uh, for example, when you, when we graduated from college, then you suddenly have to look for a job and you become a business person. That kind of life period makes you have strong stress. For example, because your role, because your identity changes from student to um, a, a business person, your role is completely different so that you don't know how to behave as a good salesperson or a good business person because you know how to behave well as a student, but right after you start working, you just feel, okay, uh, what should I do? Or uh, who am I? That kind of event is called ro role change life event that makes um, a big stress to me, to us. Another thing is, uh, 
Well, for example, when you turn to 20, uh, 30s or 40s, for example, even if you are working in the same company, but for example, if you have been a, a system engineer, but suddenly, okay, I'm sorry, our company needs money so that all of us have to become a, a, a salesperson. So we have to just uh, go selling our program to uh, all um, other uh, companies or, or, or other people outside. Then even though your identity or your uh, strength is being a system engineer, you just suddenly have to become a, a salesperson. That kind of role change is also making us uh, have stress. Uh, I, I think you have been go through those kind of similar experiences as well. Um, or of course, the biggest, or, or I don't know how to say, strongest or hardest life event will be, of course, uh, somebody somebody's death. Uh, if you love someone and it, he dies, of course, that is a life event. The second one I was talking about, the second stress is daily stress. That is different from life event. What is daily stress? Daily stress is, is yes, daily stress, for example. Well, I mean, any stress maybe we can say. Uh, for example, when you wake up, but, and then when you want to take shower, but suddenly uh, you just only have cold water, then you get so irritated. Well, I don't know what kind of house is, is this. But then when you go out for work in the train, there are so many people mashed in the train, then suddenly uh, the person next to you standing is stinky so much, it seems last night he was drunk so much, <laughs> you get irritated. Uh, if you are a woman and then you suddenly get touched by, uh, I don't know who it is, but uh, you just felt, felt very uncomfortable, that is irritation of daily. Then you just go to company, then you start working, but somehow your boss is uh, very frustrated or very stressed in other reasons, but somehow that boss is pointing out to you and then, you know, do this, do that, this report has to be done by yesterday. It's not your fault at all, but somehow the boss is irritated so that you just cannot say anything, so you just get stressed. Okay, this, that's a enough, exper uh, enough example. So this is a daily stress. So what we have to cope with are two kinds of stress. As I just said, life event, it's very difficult to cope with. But uh, another one is daily stress. It's very difficult to cope with that uh, as well. But, but at the end, I get the conclusion that uh, I'll just put down all things. But uh, through the stress management, what I learned is that you train yourself to cope with daily stress. You actually become stronger in many kinds of life events, whatever happens. But yes, of course, it's difficult. Huh? OK, that kind of things is um, um, I'm doing a seminar uh, in stress management to business people or others. Past, yes, I was a synchronous swimmer until 1988, uh, which means that uh, when I was 21 years old, Oh, that's a little mistake because I'm only uh, 25 years old right now, so that uh, this is a little different, but uh, anyway. Until 1988, I was a um, synchronized swimmer. And right after that, I went to um, become a coach. So I was a Japan national coach until 1999 for 10 years. When I was in the United States, I was uh, helping a USA Olympic coach. So I just explained about myself. So now I'm going to try to explain a, a little bit of performance enhancement. What is it? Uh, performance enhancement is a part of educational psychology compared to clinical psychology. Uh, for example, if 
you are so depressed and you are uh, burned out or you cannot eat anything anymore if you become eating disorder so which means that if you cannot perform normally then you actually have to go to clinical psychologist clinical psychologist can take care of you with uh, medication and also counseling clinical psychologists are learning clinical psychology I mean of course there are many many people who actually learn many things and put it together but a clinical psychology is a main um, study for a clinical psychologist whereas if you can perform normally you can just work normally in a daily basis even though you are tired even though you have low motivation in working but if you are still uh, perform okay then you're not gonna go to clinical psychologist but still we will have many stress probably about both about wives about husbands I'm glad my husband is not here um, uh, about many things about mothers about your parents or about your uh, children so then if you want to make yourself better by setting specific goals or uh, if you want to motivate yourself a little stronger so that you can start up the new business or if you uh, okay I just became a father so I really want to know what to do as a father then probably uh, the good idea is going to uh, there are many many um, the name of the psychologist but um, in in the United States performance enhancement consultant sports psychology consultant or educational psychology consultant uh, mental training uh, sometimes we use mental training consultant that's the that's the people you want to see so performance enhancement is not to the person who is completely down rather I am okay but I want to be better then uh, that kind of person uh, will be um, needed to um, do a performance enhancement uh, performance enhancement for example for athletes there are some skills I just uh, presented self-awareness is uh, knowing yourself I'll make it a little uh, clear later. Goal setting, relaxation, self-talk. Uh, self-talk is um, uh, try to find what you really say usually uh, in your brain, not, not outside, just uh, when you wake up, what are you talking to yourself? Or when you are in the train, what are you talking to yourself? When you are in front of the uh, such a uh, uh, bad uh, clients, what are you talking to yourself? <laughs> to to what? To to your wife? What are you talking to yourself? But you don't want to say. Uh, that is self talk. And then finding out self talk by finding out self talk, you just try to know yourself, know, know your real self, something like that. I'll talk about this later as well imagery uh, it's it's a uh, in Japanese it's, it's called image training maybe you can hear that uh, focus concentration how to focus is actually uh, we have to teach relaxation and focus together otherwise you cannot focus well uh, the last one is emotional control uh, that's the some skills that uh, I usually uh, teach to athletes so this is about just a little bit of um, educational psychology uh, uh, field. But of course, um, I'm not going to talk about all uh, theories or all things that I learned from textbooks. Uh, I thought it's clearer 
that um, if I talk about my personal experience with some theories, I thought that would be pretty um, interesting because what I did were so many stupid things and so many mistakes I made. So I thought I kind of wanted to share with you um, uh, all mistakes, but uh, still uh, what kind of things I learned from my mistakes. So I'm going to talk a little bit of my personal experience as a synchronous swimmer and also as a, uh, a retired <laughs> synchronous swimmer. Uh, synchronous swimming. How I started. Uh, 20 years ago, whenever I was in a press conference, I always talk to the media that uh, how did you start synchronous swimming? Then I always used to say that, uh, well, because I wanted to become a number one in Japan, at least number one in Japan, I really wanted to become a top person in the world so that I started synchronous swimming. I thought that kind of comment is very cool so that even though that was not true, I just said that kind of comments in the press conference, which was not true. The truth was, uh, I just saw synchronous swimming in the swimming pool one day when I was learning normal swimming. The, in the next lane, uh, some beautiful um, ladies are doing synchronous swimming. And I thought, wow, that's cool. I really want to do that. I really want to become like a beautiful ladies like this. So I just started synchronous swimming, but at the same time, if I thought about, it, if I think back, uh, at the age of ten, I was also um, thinking about death all the time. What it is is that I really don't want to die. I don't know uh, <laughs> what is death. Uh, after die, where I, where would I go? Where would I go? Uh, if I die, how can I see my parents? Thinking so much about death, I just talked to myself that, uh, why am I so scared of death? Then I, I mean, at the age of 10, so it's a little uh, stupid uh, uh, finding, but uh, I just thought, okay, the reason why I'm so scared of death is that I don't, uh, I don't want to go only by myself alone to the another world, which means that um, if I die, nobody knows me anymore. That is scary. I always want to be, be uh, surrounded by people, and I want everybody knows me. So I de decided that, OK, even if I die, or after I die, still I want to be recognized in the world so that uh, my dream at the age of 10 was that um, I want to become a historical, historically important person so that my name can be on the textbook so that even 100 years later or 1,000 years later, Yako Tanaka will be on the textbook. <laughs> How stupid it is. But that was my dream, so that um, uh, I didn't realize that dream at the age of, well, I mean, yes, at the age of 10, I, I made that dream. But at, at the same time, after two years later or three years later, I think I forgot about this completely. But somehow, subconsciously, whenever I was doing synchronous swimming so hard, I mean, training so hard, I was always thinking that I really want to become famous. I really want to put my name in that. Uh, textbook. So that was my dream. The reason why I wanted to um, talk about this is it's called self-image. Uh, having um, enormous, uh, big self-image at the in the in the elementary school age is very very important. It doesn't have to be realistic. It can be completely stupid. But self-image naturally decreases anyway once we get old. We just have to be compared. We have to do, we, we have to do so many things later on so that our self-image get decreased, decreased anyway so that it's better to have humongous 
self-image until at least 12 years old. That, that's the psychology theory, so that I just wanted to make a comment about this. At the age of 12, 12 I went to Tokyo Sin Club, which was one of the best in Japan at that time. I started training three hours a day, six days a week, two days a week in the early morning. What time do you think I was waking up for morning practice? What time is usually, okay, four. Four is pretty early, okay. Uh, four, five, probably five, oh, okay, great. Four, yes, that's true. I, I, I would wake up at 3.30, which is for me right now, it's like a sleeping time for me now, like after Roppongi, right? Like right after having ramen, you know? And then I just, I, even though I have two children already, but still I'm kind of um, crazy anyway, so okay. Um, yes, two days a week, I would wake up at uh, 3.30, left the home at 4.00, uh, arrived in a swimming pool at 4.30. From 4.30 to 5 o'clock, we were cleaning the swimming pool. We were professional because we don't have to um, mess up the water. We just so silently, quietly can get in the water so that the old dust, I don't know how to say dust, uh, completely sunk. Uh, be the, the, the floor of the water so that we just sneak into the water and then we had like a we had an underwater vacuum cleaner so, and we don't have to um, we can hold the breath so long right so that uh, because we do this cleaning free so that we can get the training facility free so that was a kind of contract so we did it, we did the uh, morning practice from five to seven. Then I went to school from, uh, no, left swimming pool at 7.15, 7.30. Went to school, and since you all of you are Japanese, you can understand probably school starts from 8.15 or 8.30 until 3.30. Go back to the same uh, swimming pool. Uh, the afternoon practice is from 5 to 8 p.m. At that time, all of you are as young as I am, probably, so that uh, you understand when you are young, we didn't have a convenience store so that uh, I couldn't buy any snacks or something. So that I rushed to the, to the home and uh, I would have dinner at home probably 9.30 p.m. or 10 p.m. After that, I started um, doing the homework. Then uh, I was able to get in the bed probably 1, 1 a.m. or something. Then next day, sometimes I had to wake up at 3.30 a.m. How healthy it is <laughs> at the age of a developmental age. Uh, what I want to say is that at this time, what kind of motivation I had Yes, that is the key in life. That's what I learned at the end. What it is is that, well, I, I just wanted to be better than yesterday. That's the only thing. If I couldn't do a um, 180 spin, then I wanted to do 180 spin, then I will I actually, next day I want to do 360 spin. Just more and more. It may be, um, if you just recall your past, maybe you, one time you are a pianist, or you one time you are, uh, uh, you are devoting something, then maybe you can imagine that, uh, ah, yes, yes, that's true, when we are a kid, you actually, want to do something more and more, better and better, because it was so interesting, and ah, yes, I did it. That kind of feeling is so important that we just continue. So that was the only motivation I had at this time. 
But first transition at the age of 15, 15 years old, uh, started going to high school, suddenly wanted to quit. Uh, somehow I just thought that um, uh, hanging out with friends is more uh, fun, not important, but it's more fun. Uh, and also, I was so alone at school. For example, I went to a women's school, and um, every Monday, all my friends are talking about what they did yesterday, which was the weekend, like a Sunday or Saturday. Oh, you know, um, yesterday we went to a Keio University um, uh, festival, or, you know, just a weird. I went to a Sacred Heart, uh, Seishin Joshi Gakuin, is a kind of like a sister-brother relationship always having to a KO um, boys, and we were so fascinated about, anyway, okay, this is a different story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, for example, no, 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 you know, we went to the festival, or we went to, uh, we went movie in Shibuya, and that movie was really interesting, Hearing that, of course, to me, it's interesting to hear all things that they did. Wow, that's good. Wow, really, that's, that sounds great. But then, uh, one day, one of my friends came to me and, you know, it's kind of tiring for us to hang out with you because each time, each Monday, I have to, we have to explain what happened to you. <laughs> and I didn't know that. And uh, then they told me, you know, I mean, you're just so busy doing synchronized swimming. Saturday, Sunday, you're bad. I mean, you, you just hang, you have to hang out to, uh, to continue being a friend group. And um, those kind of little silly things. But, uh, but suddenly I really felt that, uh, oh, this is meaningless to do synchronized swimming. So what? I became already a junior national team member so that uh, I was actually already able to have a uh, Japan flag uniform already. And uh, in the back side, it's saying Japan. I already had, uh, had two or three uniforms already as a junior national team member. So I thought, okay, okay. So I'm already kind of, kind of number one already. <laughs> uh, and uh, I already received some uniforms already, so I don't have to continue. Then. Then also I got a fatigue fracture in here uh, because we are doing a support skull like this in synchronized swimming when we are uh, upside down and doing a leg movement. We are always doing like this and because we do underwater with the water pressure, so I break my bone. That's uh, hard, huh? <laughs> There are many other things anyway. Then one time I um, told my mom, Mom, you know, I, I don't think I want to continue synchronized swimming anymore. I would like to quit. So can I just quit? I don't want to go to practice anymore. Right after I came back from school, and then that's the time actually I have to go to practice uh, around 4 p.m. or something. You know, I, I don't want to go to practice anymore. Then my mom told me, oh, great. Thank you so much. When? Right now? You, you, you're not gonna go to practice? Are you sure? You swear. You swear you're gonna quit. Uh, uh, hello? You know, you are a mother. You are supposed to be stop me uh, finishing or giving up my dream or something. And you are supposed to tell me many things, no? And then my mom said, yeah, right. God, I'm so glad finally you realized that a synchronized swimming Sucks. <laughs> and what? You are supporting me so much, and you are actually um, going to competition with me. You are actually sewing my swimsuits for me, or you are uh, sewing my headpiece for me. You just did so many things for me, and you never told me that a synchronous swimming is bad to me. And as she goes, Well, you know, to tell the truth, but since you told me finally you want to quit, so I finally really want to tell you that uh, maybe you really don't realize that I'm waking up with you at 3.30, <laughs> twice a week. What kind of mother is that? 
Now there are so many mothers actually waking up at 8.30 or 8 a.m. Or probably earliest would be 7 a.m. But still everybody is saying it's tiring to uh, uh, raise kids. I'm waking up 3.30 a.m. twice a week. I'm waiting for you uh, finishing dinner until 11 p.m. Uh, I'm always making lunch boxes, five lunch boxes a day. Do you realize that? And yeah, five boxes, of course, because I need it. All right. I, I have to. I have to eat. As a swimmer, I always have to eat. Otherwise, I lose weight. So that I'm preventing uh, from losing weight. I was always eating, so um, <laughs> I was having, yes, actually having a five uh, lunch boxes every day. But anyway, so then as she told me that, I, yes, please, just please be, um, um, uh, let me be a normal mother. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, then I heard that, but I, I got so mad at my mom. God, I can't believe you are such a bad mother. And I replied, oh, you know, I mean, if you're a normal mother, if you're a good mother, you're supposed to stop me. That's the reason why I, I just told you my stress. But you actually not only uh, stop me, uh, you, you're not, you, you don't stop me, but also you actually force me to leave. This is nonsense. I'll go to practice. And somehow I went to practice. <laughs> but in that first condition, yes, of course, I didn't want to... I didn't want to continue synchronized swimming, but at the same time, what I realized is the the life of synchronized swimming, I mean, uh, the life as a synchronized swimmer is a um, proactive thing. I mean, I decided to continue. I, I am the one who wants to do synchronized swimming. Nobody was pushing me. Nobody was forcing me. But before that, I didn't know. I kind of thought that my mom want me to be a synchronized swimmer. My coaches want me to continue synchronized uh, swimming. So at the age of 15, well, it was still subconscious. But uh, somehow I realized that, uh, OK, whenever I feel I really want to quit, I can quit. Nobody is stopping me. That realization makes me continue even more. What kind of human being is this? Maybe you have the, you could be having the same experience. Second transition, going to college. I decided to go to Nihon University instead of going to the college I really wanted to go, which means that um, I gave up uh, possible uh, successful road I wanted to go. Well, well, it seems that at the age of 17, when I had to decide college, I was having two roads, always walking, two roads together. One is, e even if I fail in synchronized swimming, I still am um, pursuing um, uh, studying so that I can, I can say to society that, uh, oh, you know, I am a da 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 university student, uh, cool university name, student, so that, you know, even though I fail in synchronized swimming, still I'm studying so well that I'm in this good name university. Or well, I'm not saying Nihon University is not a good name, but uh, okay, anyway. So um, I wanted to go to a very uh, big name university. And also, I wanted to become a successful synchronized swimmer. But then, at the age of 17, I had to choose only one road. Then I chose synchronized swimming. It was really painful because um, both of my parents uh, completely opposed to me because they told me that, uh, you know, synchronized swimming? What is good about this? <laughs> This is just a sport, and then they oppose to me. And then even if you you start continuing, you don't know whether you're gonna succeed or not. You you are not uh, 
control, you, you cannot control that you will be becoming an Olympian for sure in four years. There is no one guarantee thing. But I, this is the second time I decided myself that I wanted to pursue synchronized swimming. So, talking about whole process, it seems that um, I am a such a good, I'm having a such a good will athlete, but which is not true. Uh, I used to have intrinsic motivation, which is the one I uh, explained that uh, I want to uh, have this skill better than yesterday. That kind of feeling is um, intrinsic motivation. I only had that kind of motivation, but starting from 18 years old, because synchronous swimming became popular, uh, recognized by uh, showing the name of Mikako Kotani, maybe all of you are Japanese and probably you know the name, uh, she is one of the very, very famous synchronized swimmers in Japan. Uh, <laughs> she was my rival, and she was uh, the same age as me. Uh, I thought uh, I was a rival of her. And uh, I don't know the reason exactly, but I think Mikako Kotani-san is a, just a little bit more beautiful than I, <laughs> probably just a little bit cuter than I, or probably just a little bit. Uh, she's uh, having a longer legs, or more flexible, that her performance is a little bit better than I. So that somehow, um, she is actually always on the media, as you know, on TV, on newspapers, having interviews a lot. Uh, that was the first time for me to compare myself to her. Even though I was always, always comparing myself in the competition, of course. She got first, I got second. I sometimes got first, <laughs> she got second. But um, starting from that year, started having only extrinsic motivation. It's also called extrinsic reward. Winning, or maybe not winning. For me, at that time, beating her was so important. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds slightly different, right? Hate it, lose. Hate it to lose. That, that's, a, that's a good one, though. I will want it to be recognized. That's the, the first one and the third one. It's so big that I lost my intrinsic motivation. In sports, that sometimes works. Uh, for example, um, in my experience, in 1980, 1985, synchronized swimming became popular, Mikako-san became popular, so that I really hated that fact. So I always felt so irritated, so stressed, so mad that all negative emotion was always into the practice. So that in the practice, I was always ah, mad <laughs> and doing so hard. And when swimmers are doing only uh, egg beating, egg beating is a, it's called a tachi oyogi, ne? egg beating. Uh, they go on the underwater, try to be staying like this. We have to do like this, legs. That's called egg beater because it's beating eggs. It sounds like uh, doing a beating eggs, so that's what it's called. Uh, when we do only three minutes egg beating practice, uh, everybody's doing egg, egg beating for three minutes. I was always sneaking and uh, putting the two kilogram uh, weight belt. Uh, they are not doing anything, but only myself, I was putting a two kilogram belt. And uh, so what I just really wanted to do is something harder than everybody, something stronger than everybody. Some things uh, uh, faster than anybody. That's the motivation always. At the end, of course, 1986, I became a solo champion in Japan. 
I was very happy. But sometimes, I mean, well, many times in sports, particularly, uh, this extrinsic motivation works really well. Probably sometimes in business as well, but you know the outcome. Right after becoming solo champion, I was very happy, but at the same time, I was so happy to beat her. Not I was so happy to win, so that next day, I lost my motivation. I didn't want to practice anymore. I don't know how to practice. I, I just lost completely that, why do I have to do this practice? Why do I have to practice so hard? Whole year, I lost my motivation, both. I mean, of course, I lost the intrinsic already, so that I lost the extrinsic motivation, majorly, be mainly because many people started recognizing me, so that I felt so good myself, that, oh, okay, this is enough. I don't have to be uh, working harder and harder to be more recognized anymore, because I am already recognized. And then I lost motivation a year. Then, after I lost in 1987, which means I, I became a, a second in solo and sinking and swimming to the Japan National, then looking back my past, I realized rival is within you, focus inside. And uh, well, like if you demand the real excellence of yourself, then be willing to pay the price of it, which means, well, I just um, try to focus myself. Last, uh, only the, the, the year, uh, one year only before the Olympics, I was really able to go back to intrinsic motivation and uh, I was able to work uh, as hard as possible. Then I became a uh, medalist in duet. Too bad that I was not able to become a solo representative in Japan. Uh, Mikako-san became a solo uh, representative and she became a gold, uh, bronze medal in solo. And uh, we uh, received the bronze medal in duet as well. Uh, maybe you guys really don't need to see that, but I just thought, since my, <laughs> since my speech is not good, so that I thought, okay, this is a great excuse. <laughs> like, oh, great, you know, tonight I saw a medal. <laughs> then you can just forget about my speech, so that I, I just put it here. Um, I'll just pass this to, uh, to all of you. So you can just touch, don't eat. That's what <laughs> I don't want you to do. But you can touch, no problem. You can actually uh, uh, do a, a, a photo ne? and uh, take a picture as well, no problem. There's no copyright here, so then <laughs> please do so. And then just a little bit of explaining that um, uh, this uh, is a pigeon. The, the pigeon side is the front side for Seoul Olympic in 1988. So this is the front side. And the back side looks really front side, uh, maybe you can see later. This is the back side. And the back side is always, always a back side in a whole uh, past Olympics. So uh, 1916 Rome Olympics or 1984 Moscow, uh, all Olympics have the same back side. And this is only so original. The side, it's saying, Synchronized swimming duet. Because it's 20 years ago, <laughs> it's only shown the sports name. But uh, now, when you see uh, younger athletes, uh, younger medalists, then they have their names on it. But at that time, we didn't have the name. Anyway, let me continue. Okay, I I was very very happy to make the dream come true. Uh, I felt I was number one, well, at least number one in Japan. I was a bronze medalist in the whole world. I was very happy. I thought I was a successful woman. I thought I was a great person. I thought I was such a, well, anyway, great person, I thought. And then, um, at that time, whenever I was walking or uh, getting in a train, Everybody's recognized me. Oh, Mirakotanaka-san, 
just uh, let me take a picture with with you. Uh, please just uh, you know, write an autograph, autograph to me. God, I was very happy <laughs> because maybe you remember that my one of the dreams is to be recognized. So that I was very very happy. So that is a great life. Lasted for about two years. Ah, that was so nice. And then. And then after two years, I realized that, okay, things are a little bit became, becoming different because many, many people start uh, not noticing me anymore. They are just passing by. Like, okay, uh, hello, you don't need my sign. You don't need my signature. Oh, you don't need my picture. Hello, I mean, this is, maybe you didn't see me well enough, but uh, I am a medalist, you know, do you know me? Nobody starts uh, interested in me. Then I was, okay, what happened to this world? I am, still am, a medalist, and nobody is recognizing me. Finally realized what was ended. That kind of thing is actually, I'm sometimes talking to a retired uh, person at the age of 65 or, because sometimes uh, the very, very looking great uh, man around 65, 67 has a name card still. And you know, I was an uh, executive, executive uh, person of this big company two years ago. And wow, you are still having this name card for two years. That kind of ego. I exactly have the same thing, but I finally realized that, wow, okay, I am still a Methodist, but at the same time, uh, I'm, not no, I'm no longer thinking a swimmer. And then I started coaching already, but I just, well, since I was so immature that I, I couldn't find the great thing about coaching because I wanted to be in the center still. And then started thinking that who am I? And what is my goal in life? Then I got depressed. And the time was actually uh, the time I really wanted to kill myself. This is really silly, but uh, I was thinking that there's not an interesting goal anymore in life. Married, having a kid, yeah, right. Everybody does this. I am so special. <laughs> I'm so special that I am not supposed to pursue a normal dream, normal goal. I am not a normal person. So uh, I, well, I actually uh, standing in the Ikebukuro station uh, platform for six hours, thinking to die. <laughs> but it's very silly. Yes, thank you very much for laughing. Yes, this is very, very silly. I was only 23 years old or something, and I just felt life is ended. And then what kind of retirement life should I make? <laughs> then, uh, well, somehow things happened and decided to go to the United States. When I went to the United States, uh, of course, at the first year, I really didn't speak English at all, so that I went to an English school, a beginner English class. Uh, then uh, I started learning um, uh, from the beginning. Then, s s some reason, I went to uh, the the college library, and I happened to grab the psychology book. And then, not the first page. Somehow, opening the sports psychology book, there is a topic written that athletic retirement. Ah, a chapter in athletic retirement? I never heard of that in the, in the college in Japan. What is it about? And then in, in athletic retirement chapter, the first paragraph, it's saying winning is not everything. And I thought, yeah, right. You know, those kind of researchers or professors they don't know what sports are about. You know, winning is everything, of course, in life. What are you talking about? 
then I started reading and realized that because many, many retired elite athletes have difficulty knowing winning is not everything, well, you get lost in the second life, the second uh, life after sports. That comment was really interesting to me, then started mental training. Then in the first graduate program in sports psychology, I, I, I went to St. Mary's College of California uh, yes. graduate program from 1992 to 1995. Uh, master's program in physical education, uh, specialization in sports psychology. In that sports psychology uh, program, started knowing uh, many, many great things to help me. What I learned are this. One is emotional control. That's what I uh, learned first in the master's program. Knowing what you feel and why you feel, the theory I learned was rational emotive behavioral theory. That is also called ABC theory. When we, hmm, what kind of exa examples I should make? Ah, okay, for example, my um, situation right now. Uh, today's speech experience is making me nervous so much. For example, so to me, my A is having a speech in English at Anaheim University in front of Japanese people who actually completely look like understanding Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> means adversity. A stands for adversity. Adversity or activating event, depending on uh, researchers. A is a adversity or activating event. So it's like, a, it's simply what it is, is stress situation, anything, any stressful situation. That's an A. When we have A, we automatically think that uh, we have C, which means uh, stress feeling. C stands for con uh, consequence. We don't know there is B between A and C. B is belief system. B, belief system. We are actually having stress or even like happiness only through B. So for example, if I have, uh, oh, okay, then my A was I'm having a speech in English, and my B is talking to myself that, uh, you know, Tanaka, you really have to do well, you know, you have to do your best. You should do this because this is a great experience, but this is only experience, so that you really have to do well Otherwise, you get, you get uh, when you get failed, you, you are bad, you are a stupid person. And my president, uh, the, there's a, my business partner there already, so my, my business partner, Junko, will be mad at me, you know, if I do bad. <laughs> if I have that kind of, it's called irrational belief, then I get more tense, right? Even if making a speech is as just a making a speech in English, of course, maybe that, that'll be a little bit of uh, making you nervous, but at the same time, this is just a speech. You can fail, it's no problem, because Anthony speaks Japanese as well, it's no problem. But if you feel A as a big thing in your belief system, then you get really frustrated or you get really uh, anxious about this. So this B system has to be changed for all of us. To release your stuff, stress, we're not gonna be able to change A, right? 
We cannot change your voice, voice suddenly. We cannot change the English speech suddenly to, uh, to Japanese. <laughs> Whenever you have something uncontrolling to you, some, some situation you cannot control to change, then you just only need to change your belief system. For example, to me, I was nervous. Oh God, I don't want to go to Anaheim University today. God, this is so difficult. What happens if I just suddenly, oh, 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 what should I say? You know, then I get so screwed. I, I don't want to do that. Then I thought, well, you know, I'm okay. If I get completely failed, then just I ask David and okay. Just please translate to me. So it's completely fine. It's no problem. I just anybody will be uh, speaking Japanese. Maybe I can just start speaking Japanese. And I just trying to think to myself that this is not a big issue. It's no problem. So that's what I learned, and it was very very valuable to me. And the second one is self awareness. That is uh, relating to the emotional control as well, because. To find out your real belief system, you really have to know yourself what kind of thoughts you are always having. It's saying self-talk magic word, why? Whenever you talk to yourself, ah, I'm tired, then you have to ask yourself, but Miyako, Miyako-san, why are you tired so much? What are you tired about? Then I usually thought, well, I don't know, I'm just tired. No, 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 not just tired. Why are you so tired? What, what is it, what it is? Then I would say, well, because, you know, I have to have, uh, I have to finish my research paper by this week. That makes me stressed. Okay, uh, why do you have to get so stressed about this research paper? Well, just, you have to go why, why, why all the time. That is starting to find out your real uh, thought or real uh, desire or real motivation. At last was goal setting. Goal setting sometimes tends to only trying to think about future, but which is not true. Um, when we try to set our own personal goal, we really have to know what you really wanted, what you really needed in the past. So that what I did in the program was that it's called Lifeline. Uh, I was writing my life on the paper using Lifeline. It's very simple, but it was very uh, valuable to me. You just have to recall your um, life from the beginning. Uh, what kind of life event made you happy or made you sad? Um, for example, to me, when I was 21, I got bronze medal, so probably my happy feeling at the age of 21 is here. When I, when I was 15 years old, I got a stress fracture and I kind of burned out, so maybe you have it here. Then you just put, you do like this, then you trace, and that is called lifeline. It looks very simple, but to me, it takes time, not only time, it takes ear, probably, I was able to write this lifeline uh, that it took 
probably three or four years. Why? Because I didn't know what I really wanted or what I didn't want to know what I really felt in the past. For example, what I really did is first, when I learned about this in front of a sports psychologist, I said, okay, I can write it. So easy because I'm always thinking back my, uh, my past, so it's no problem. Then I was probably 25 years old at the time, so I wrote like, like this. Like this. What is wrong about this? It's only plus, huh? It's only plus. As if I was such a happy person all the time. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 the professor asked me, okay, okay, I'm sorry, Miyako. Maybe you didn't understand English well. So I will explain a little slowly, okay? Then. Yes. You know, Miyako, this lifeline, you can actually write to the minus point as well. So if you feel a little sad, this can be here. So you can make it a little bigger. Then I told, I answered to him that, okay, doctor. Probably you really don't know me. <laughs> I, I am a medalist, and I was a, well, almost superstar, you know, at the time. Oh, you are American, of course you don't know who I was. Of course I had only positive life in my past. I am such a strong person that I never felt sad, I never felt disappointed, I was always positive, and I was always happy. Then he, he came to me and he laughed at me and he was so, he looked so happy that, Miyako, welcome to mental training. And, uh, <laughs> it seemed he thought that, uh, oh, Miyako Tanaka is such a great client, um, having uh, such a big ego and uh, doesn't want to realize all real uh, herself. Anyway, so in a few years, uh, a few years later, I found myself that my life line was, sorry, it's in black again, um, I forgot around here, but, and I like this. And too many downs. But what I would like to say is that finding out here, or finding out here is knowing yourself. What kind of events really making you happy? What kind of events really making you sad or stressed? I didn't know before the Olympics uh, that Mikako-san was very famous and I was very sad. I didn't know that. At the age of 25 in the United States, in that master's program, by writing this life line, finally I realized that, uh, oh, I was jealous of her at that time. I didn't know, and I really didn't know. I didn't want to recognize. I didn't want to know that I was so stupid that I am the person who is jealous of somebody else. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So what is important is that when you when we do goal setting, we really have to know this and this so that you really know what you really want. So the I'm gonna just talk to the um, what I really learned at the end is uh, starting to this story. Um, maybe you can read, but I'll read as well with you. There was an old man, a boy, and a donkey. A donkey is sometimes also called an ass. They were going to town, and it was decided that the boy should ride. As they went along, they passed some people who exclaimed that it was a shame for the boy to ride and the old man to walk. The man and the boy decided that maybe the critics were right, so they changed positions. Later, they passed some more people who then exclaimed that it was a real shame for the man to make such a small boy walk. 
the two decided that maybe they both should walk. Soon, they passed the more people who explained that it was stupidity to walk when they had a donkey to ride. The man and the boy decided maybe the critics were right, so they decided that they both should ride. <laughs> they soon passed other people who explained that it was a shame to put such a load on a poor little animal. The old man and the boy decided that maybe the critics were right, so they decided to carry the donkey. <laughs> As they crossed the bridge, they lost their grip on the animal, and the donkey fell into the river and drowned. The moral of the story <coughs> is that if you try to please everyone, you will finally lose your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that story. <laughs> this is probably this is very classic because this story is on the psychology book. But uh, I think I read this story first time <coughs> was probably yeah, when I was 27, 28. And that was exactly me. I wanted to play, praise everybody, so I always tried to find a solution for them, for her, for him. And I didn't have my philosophy or my way because I was so scared of telling all people that this is my belief. Confident of uh, any reasons. So at that time, this is my uh, this is the word from uh, professor at that time, and this is my favorite word. The greatest thing in your life is being who you are. This is the only thing. You don't have to praise anybody. You just know what you want what you want to do, what you want to become, what you want to be, and being who you are is the most important thing. Uh, of course, this is very difficult, but uh, uh, I'm always looking back this word and uh, I try to just uh, sustain my confidence. And uh, sometimes I fail, sometimes I uh, get succeeded, but still try to think, who am I? So this is uh, my ultimate of uh, Managing stress. <laughs> Did I finish? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, here's your chance. When I was thinking that there should be a difference between uh, ordinary people and athletes, then at that time I really thought it was difficult to coach or teach. Uh, mental training to ordinary people, but um, probably um, two or three years before, uh, two or three years ago, probably I noticed that um, everybody has, simply everybody has different feeling, different issues different demands. So it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what kind of positions you are either. Uh, simply, I just try to look at everybody's eyes. Uh, what kind of uh, comments are interesting to him or this person or that person? Uh, that's what I try to focus. So um, try to think about the difficulty or difference, uh, differences. Probably athletes, oh yes, that's true, thank you very much. <laughs> Probably athletes have specific goals, yes, that's true. So we, I only can focus on how to get there because there is a road already made. So it's like a train already that, you know, Miyako-san, I want to go to this ultimate station. So how to get this train in uh, expressway, uh, express train. Express train, yes, instead of uh, yeah, normal train. But yes, that's true. There are some some business people seminar. Um, people tell me that they don't have ultimate goal. They don't have specific goal, but they somehow want to become kind of the person like this. 
it's like for me, uh, instead of teaching how to get into this train and quickly going to that station, instead of that, I feel I'm having a, a coach, the horse and the, nani, the person. Then, uh, hi, client, uh, where do you want to go? And then they, maybe he would tell me, oh, okay, kind of north. But uh, I don't know what kind of north I want to go. Uh, okay, and then why don't we just start? And do, 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 do. Then, no, 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 stop, stop, Miyako. Uh, I want to see this mountain. Okay, then why don't we just stop the mountain? So, yes, the target is there, but it's not specific. And um, it, it doesn't have to be shortcut either. Surprisingly, that's the difference. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yes. Thank you. How did you control your stress before a competition? Oh, when I was athlete? Mm -hmm. Yes. I, thank you. I talked about that exactly the same thing to I Miyazato san, Miyazato Ai san, a professional, uh, women professional golfer. Uh, when I was teaching mental training to all uh, golfers a few years ago, um, she was exactly having the same uh, skills that I used to have, which was, uh, what do you know? Uh, in English, uh, try to think. Try to think, not to think. I mean, in your brain, not thinking anything at all. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm not thinking anything at all. I'm not thinking anything at all. Try to think, I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking. <laughs> because in Buddhism, I think that, okay, you know, you have to go nothing. I mean, it's so difficult to feel nothing. I mean, nothing means nothing. So for me, you have such an empty, a lot of spare uh, brain, so that you have, you can have so many weird stress into the brain. So I just want to think so many. I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking <laughs> so much that I, you, I'm not going to be able to think something else. So no thinking, no thinking, no thinking, no thinking. Then I feel a little better. And the Miyazato Ai Chan was telling me that um, uh, right after she did a double bogey or something bad, then she just uh, pick up the ball and then going back to the next uh, hole. No thinking, no thinking, no thinking. Because golfers have too much time to think. That's what she told me. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, that's the, um, yes, things I, I did. And also just being a good posture is also a good thing to me. Um, whenever I was being like this, you just only have negative feeling only.
while I was after it, or after? Uh, after now. After now? Yeah. And do you have any regrets about the sport? Ah. Or that things that you would change? No regrets. Uh, do I? Um, probably not. But um, sports, passion. Yes. Um, I retired at the age of 21. And I started a coach, 14 years. At that time, well, I hope my athletes are not uh, hearing this um, speech, but uh, <laughs> at that time, that 10 years, I really didn't like synchronized swimming. I really didn't like sports. Especially when I was in the United, in the United States, because I found out that uh, winning was not everything, winning was not everything, uh, I kind of, on purpose, try to hate sports, try to, it doesn't have to be sports, but a competitive thing. I really don't want to feel value on that anymore. Uh, at that time, I really didn't like it. And then I really felt that um, I want to overcome my past, which was, used to be a medalist, so that I wanted to be better than a <laughs> medalist, which is competition, huh, I think. Um, at that time, I really do, didn't want to get involved in sports. But now, uh, probably starting from five years ago, six years ago, when I started a business with Junko, um, yeah, I, I really started thinking that my identity, my original identity is a person who loves sports. And uh, now, uh, since last year, at the age of 40, I really felt that, uh, God, since I have two kids already, my body looks so old. <laughs> so that uh, I decided to go to the gym, and I decided to do the personal training, uh, muscle training, uh, weight training. And uh, now it's uh, two or three times a week. Oh, God, I love it so much. Muscle hurting or uh, muscle aching. That is my pleasure right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, to the end, yes, yes I really do uh, love sports. But uh, yes, it's true that uh, I don't know what about sports environment. Uh, yeah, I have many few feelings about it, especially in Japan. Would you, your kids now, would you want the same? <laughs> Thank you for the difficult question. <laughs> uh, try to have balance all the time. Uh, because my son is eight, my daughter is five, they know, kind of they know, that I was an Olympic athlete. My husband was, a, was an athlete. Um, I try to make a balance so that I try not to tell them too much about sports. <laughs> Maybe it's not true, huh? <laughs> well, but somehow my son's dream is already that uh, at school, my son Hugo was telling to the teacher that, oh, I want to become a professional soccer player. Uh, so, uh, but but uh, what I really want to focus on all the time to kids uh, is that winning is not important process is the most important thing. So do fail, do make mistakes, do make mistakes as many as possible so you can actually learn. But don't try to make mistakes. Just try to win so hard, try to uh, pursue your excellence so hard, but then when you make mistakes, great, great to have that kind of major mistakes so that you can actually learn a lot from that. So, um, am I too enthusiastic right now? <laughs> um, so in that way, yes, sports, you know, well, uh, yes, try to have a balance, but maybe I, I was not behaving well. <laughs> Yeah. 
skating. Um, they didn't used to have mental trainer, but now it seems they do. They used to have different people, but um, uh, I was only um, hearing the rumors. But uh, yesterday, each of them has uh, um, a professional in mental preparation. Uh, so yes, that probably uh, has a good influence to their performances. But at the same time, um, whenever some athletes come to my office to, to do mental training, most of them really don't need mental training at all. Most of them. Because they just only want to rely on mental training. They just only want to rely on the, uh, the image that, oh, because I have mental weaknesses, I lost. Which is not true. The real reason is, God, you just didn't practice well, that's all. <laughs> so, um, in Japan, yes, when I, when I talk to uh, Koji Murofushi-kun. Murofushi-kun is a, is it a hammer, I think, hammer. Uh, gold medalist in the Olympics. Yes, he told me that um, he really didn't need mental training at all, but uh, his preparation to competition, 99.9%. .9%, yes, that is physical training and uh, technique training, but just 0.1 to the last, last end is mental. So, I mean, I mean this is the, the classic many, many athletes to say it. But, um, yes, so that um, many times you really don't need mental training. But at the same time, for kids, yes, I think it's very important to teach mental training. It doesn't have to be mental training. At least self-awareness. To know yourself. To know your weaknesses. To know your strengths. At the uh, early age, I think it's very, very important, especially in Japan, because it's very difficult for us to have self-philosophy. Still, it's really difficult compared to uh, Western cultures, I feel. That is different from mental training, so. So, um, you're now working to help athletes transition out of their athletic careers into new jobs, right? Yes, yes. Or new careers? Yeah. And can you just tell us a little bit about what you teach them? Mm -hmm especially to uh, professional uh, soccer players uh, called J-leaguers. Um, when J-leaguers are already um, old enough to think about themselves, uh, by themselves, then it's easier. For example, when you are 35 already, when you are 30 already, then they know already uh, about the, the society already outside of sports. But uh, when they are 20 or 21 years old, uh, who has no experience but soccer only, <laughs> then it's really hard for them to think about other identity. So what I do mostly is identity um, realization, which is, yes, you were a professional soccer player for a long time, but uh, you are not only a professional soccer player. You are a Yakutanaka, uh, or you are a, a student of uh, that, this school. You are the, 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 the son of the family. <coughs> try to find other identities. Or try to tell them that Try to tell them that, um, yeah, try to tell them winning is not everything either, uh, as well. And um, yeah, just uh, try to set a goal for by teaching them career design theory. What you want, what you can, what you can do, what kind of skills you have, what you want, and what kind of needs society have. So three dimension, we talk about it. And then, in that skill-wise, most of the, the old athletes put zero. Well, I can just kick ball, but uh, I don't have any skills. I cannot write, uh, do computers. 
I can not speak English, I have no business skills at all, then we just focus on this as a life skill program, which is that, well, for example, when you are in a competition, what kind of concentration skills do you have? Then, well, what I try to focus on like that, like this, what kind of relaxation skills you have, then all relaxation skills you did as a player, all mental skills used in the sports life can be useful to business area. So you are already so strong in many, many life skills. Then they feel like, oh, is it true? I can use this? Of course, you know, like, you know how to motivate yourself. This is a skill. Then they didn't know this is a skill. So uh, they feel that uh, we are in the sports field so narrow, so that we feel that uh, I mean, athletes feel that uh, oh, anybody knows how to motivate uh, himself. No, no, I don't think so. Just go out to society, you will know. Then, uh, yeah, trying to um, yeah, find them, find them, uh, find their strengths, and also uh, trying to uh, uh, reshape the identity. Wanting to win is, yes, really positive, I think. But how to win is really a key. Um, just to win, you can actually only pursue excellence. That's the, the focus you really need to do. Whereas, I need to beat this person, I need to beat that person. For example, uh, the reason why I failed in 1987 is that I just always looked at rivals' performances in the practice time because I want to win so much that I'm always trying to adjust my performance every day. For example, uh, okay, this person, uh, Mikako-san, is sick today so that she's not performing well. Ah, that's good, so I don't have to practice so much. Well, I'm a little bit over exaggerating, but, but yes. Or for example, if I, uh, if I just beat her, even though my time was so slow, but still I just compared to any other rivals, and ah, oh, good, I was I'm number one in Japan, which is good, so I'm satisfied already. Mm -hmm. Easily satisfied by comparing to others. Which it's it's okay if you don't become a number one in Japan or number one in the world. Once you become a number one in the world, okay, how to win? The process is completely different. So um, yeah, that's the reason why. Yes, it's true. Uh, um, winning thinking is important, but uh, the way of thinking probably is different. Hey, we'd like to trade medals. <laughs> 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 <laughs>